Yeah, so welcome everybody. I'll keep this short and sweet. Um, so my name is Jenna Gatsky. Um, I run Carol's uh, Prairie Springs Environmental Education Center. Uh, most of you know me, but we're very excited to have this partnership with the alumni office um, this semester and going into next semester too. Um, so I work a lot with Kim Hofkamp in the education department. So um, she was gracious enough to find a wonderful speaker for us this evening. Um, so I'll actually have her introduce Loriana from KEEP. Um, but so we'll go from there, but we can chat more throughout the program and after too, but it's great to see everybody um, on one more time, some of you. So Kim, go ahead. All right, great. So as an advisory member, I'm an advisory member on the Prairie Springs Environmental Ed Center team. So really committed to the work that is done there uh, by faculty, students, staff. Um, I'm also an education faculty member, as now you caught on. Um, so I've been in teacher preparation for more than 15 years at Carroll University and have amazing students. Um, I am lucky enough to teach in the education program. I'm a former seventh grade science teacher, and I have the pleasure tonight to introduce Mrs. Loriana Raymond Duvernel, who will engage all of you in some an energy exploration. Um, she's an educator, she's an author of a beautiful children's book, under in the <laughs> I have to do a little plug. I just got it, Lorianne, in the mail. Um, and I met her through her work at uh, KEEP, which stands for its K-12 Energy Education Program out of UW Stevens Point. Uh, Lorianne, it each comes each semester to facilitate about a two-hour workshop for our future elementary education teachers. Uh, and they have a chance then to participate in experiences and learn about resources to support the integration of energy across academic content areas. So according to Carol U students each semester, um, and a couple, well, Ryan is an, an elementary ed, he's an alum in elementary ed, uh, the time flies by when she visits our class. And so I know tonight um, will be the same for you as she gets you um, excited about um, energy education and thinking and learning and uh, and this is geared for all ages so maybe some of you I know Todd was maybe going to bring the kids and if anybody else has kids around that's that's awesome too so thanks thanks Loriana for joining us all right well thanks Kim for that introduction it's it's nice to see a few faces who I know um, and uh, it's nice to see adults as well because I oftentimes am teaching to Zoom classes of children or college students. And so this is a, a nice little change of pace. Um, again, my name is Loriana. I do teach for the K-12 Energy Education Program out of UW Stevens Point. Um, it is a piece of the Wisconsin Center for Environmental Education. Um, and they've got a number of different programs that help support uh, environmental education across the state in our K-12 schools. Um, want to just let you know that the KEEP program is sponsored by uh, the utilities around the state. So in, here in so uh, Southeast Wisconsin, um, we've got We Energies, but across the state, all the utilities uh, chip in to help fund uh, this kind of education program so that we can get this information out to students, teachers, and families um, hope, in the hopes that uh, we can be a little more energy literate across the state of Wisconsin. Um, my other part-time job is I do teach for uh, the school district of Waukesha. Um, they have an environmental education program that has been in place since the 1970s. And there's a team of about 10 of us teachers uh, and we meet with all of the kids in the Waukesha school district. So about 10,000 kids annually. Um, and we do outdoor education, we do uh, river studies, we take them out to Lapham Peak and do glacier studies and things like that. And um, I always say I had a fifth grade student a couple of years ago was walking down with me to the river and he was like, you get to do this for a job? And I always say, yeah, it's kind of a, a great job to have. It has been pretty or different in this virtual world, but um, different opportunities, which is kind of neat as well. So anyways, for today, we have about uh, 45 minutes together. What I'm gonna be doing is taking some of the activities that I typically do with my pre-service teacher classes. Um, 
modify them a little bit to do with you guys, but um, the overall goal of tonight is just to make you more aware of the energy that you use in your daily life, um, depending on you know what you do and where you go. And, and through that awareness, making you maybe make some different decisions on energy conservation within your own home. Um, so I've got a couple of uh, activities. We'll get you up and moving hopefully a little bit as well. Um, the first activity that we are gonna do is going to require that you either have a piece of paper and a pencil or coloring materials, whatever, or if you just wanna use your phone to either draw or jot down some notes, um, that's all you'll need for, that first, um, for this first activity. Uh, so the first activity we're gonna do is, uh, I call it our ideal day. So what I need you to do as you're getting your uh, drawing materials or, or whatnot together is I want you to imagine if you could design the best day you could ever possibly have. It, and there's no time boundaries, there's no space boundaries, you can travel, there's no COVID, <laughs> there's airplanes that we can go on. Um, and, and what would you do? How would you spend your time? And again, time not a factor. So you can go all over the place. I'm just gonna hold mine up real quick. I'm not gonna give you a big look at it because I don't want you to um, feel like you have to do anything like me, but simple drawings are best, just a few ideas. Um, and I'll give you uh, about five minutes, maybe three to five minutes, either write down those ideas you have on how you would spend your time or draw some quick pictures. And then after a few minutes, we're going to just kind of hold them up to the screens um, if you're comfortable doing that and share some of, of your ideas. I do want to throw out there um, as a piece of this activity, I do need to kind of call on one person and just ask you a whole bunch of questions about your day and dig a little deeper. And if you're willing to do that, uh, if you wouldn't mind just throwing uh, your name and say, I'm cool with getting asked questions in the chat. Um, that way, when, when we get going with this activity, I will uh, call on you. So three or so, maybe five minutes, uh, somewhere around 722, how about? All right, David Miller, thank you very much. I will pick on you a little bit. Not too much, don't worry. Well, while you guys are finishing up your drawings, I'll just I'll hold mine up um, and go through mine real quickly just so you get an idea of, of who I am and the things that I have on here. Um, I've got uh, some mountains on here and a couple of people hiking. Um, given a choice of anything uh, to do in life, I would be hiking in the mountains somewhere. Um, we love backpack camping. And so, yes, we would be out west <laughs> uh, in normal times. Um, definitely would have a book at some point. Um, I love reading, I love writing as well. Um, down here, I've got uh, scuba diving. Uh, definitely somewhere tropical. Scuba diving in Wisconsin is meh. So would wanna travel somewhere to do that. And then some kind of a bonfire at the end of, of our day, um, just to spend some time as a family or with friends. And then this is an idea I always say, I, I stole it from one of the students in one of Kim's grad classes. Um, she just put a big like check mark on her page and she was like, I just want everything done. All the projects I have, all of the homework that I need to do, all of the dishes, housework, whatever, everything is done. And, and I really love that idea. Let's see if you guys can see this, but I've got in my one of my top corners uh, for hiking. I like to go hiking. I'm writing a science fiction novel right now. So this oh. middle one is, is a book, if you can see that. I'm a terrible drawer, so I labeled them all. Um, with things like book Valid. and tree and um, I like planting trees um, as well as just identifying them and looking at them as a bot as a botany guy that's that's fun sure. hiking in the mountains uh, building fires is something I really like to do in my free time like mm -hmm. make it a challenge like I do like flint and survival stuff mm. um, and then skiing I'm a big cross-country skier and then a greenhouse because that's where I work these days well, it's good to want to do something that, you know, for your work that you want to do right. in an ideal day too. Cool. Thanks for sharing. All right. So in looking at David's drawing and looking at yours, can you identify some ways that energy is required to do the things you want to do? So it might be electrical energy. It might be heating and cooling energy. It might be fuel to get you someplace. It might be some kind of renewable or non-renewable energy, but these are all, all terms that we um, start off with to get uh, 
kids and, and people just like you thinking about the energy that we use in our daily lives. David, what are some things that you're noticing right away in your drawing? Well, I guess from a more of a consumption end, I mean, to burn, to burn firewood, you need the wood. So that's a, a certain amount of carbon you need there. I mean, even to, to physically write a book, I mean, you need the paper that, you know, all of the, the pulp industry there to, mm -hmm. to make that paper. For me to drive to work, I mean, I only live about a mile away, but that's an amount of gas every day to get to the greenhouse. The greenhouse needs heat. Um, I wish it was solar, it isn't. So uh, that is that is some fossil fuels because in Sheboygan, we're fueled by a coal-fired power plant. So that's mm -hmm. more fossil fuels than I would, I would like. Um, if I'm skiing, um, a lot of the skis are fiberglass made and there's probably pollution in the production of the skis. Um, and then to get to the mountains, I need to drive. So mm -hmm. there's a lot, a lot there. And if I have to drive somewhere to hike, it's a lot there. So transportation is my biggest one. Yeah. And and when we do look at um, even one object, there's a there's a great YouTube video out there called um, eye pencil. So if you guys Google eye pencil or, or look it up on YouTube, what it does is it takes a look at a pencil like this and all the different materials that go into it, all the different steps that go into it and all the different inputs that go into it. And, all, and like you said, all the transportation costs that go into something as simple as a pencil. And um, it's just a, a neat way to look at how as a world we come together to make simple objects. It's not something that I could make with the materials I have at home. Um, and so definitely looking at all of the things that go into our daily lives um, is pretty eye-opening. Um, can I focus in on a couple parts of your day, David? Is that still all right? Sounds good. All right, so um, you like cross-country skiing and um, I assume you do it around here and, and maybe go somewhere, like you said, you'll need to tra go uh, use transportation to get there a little bit. Um, when you are going to go cross country skiing, do you go for like a whole day or like a couple hours here and there? It really depends upon the time of the year. Like over winter break, I make the long trek up into Northern Wisconsin and the upper peninsula of Michigan. Um, but uh, on a weekly basis, like, you know, when school's in session, it'll be kind of a, kind of just a couple hours here and there for a day, okay. about a half hour drive. Okay, so my experience with um, cross country skiing is it's a lot of work. I'm a downhill skier, and so when I think about cross country skiing, I'm always like, oh, it's just so much work. But in order for me to, or for you to do that cross country skiing, do you need some kind of energy in order to do it? Mm hmm. Yep, Where so do you get that energy from? So perhaps in terms of like my uh, the food fuel or what fuels my body to go, yep. I've got to yep. eat. You know, perhaps if I eat meat, that meat had to eat plants. So it all comes originally from the sun. Um, you know, that's where the energy all originates from, but certainly from food. Okay, perfect. So you're like two steps ahead of me. Um, so this is an activity I've done with kids of all ages. Um, we take a look at your lunch or your breakfast or whatever you happen to have around you. And we we figure out where does that energy originate from? And maybe you said it perfectly right. All of that energy, we can trace back to the sun. So whether you have um, a sandwich in your lunch or whether you had cereal that morning for breakfast, whatever it was, we can go from the food to an animal if needed or food to plant and then plant and talk about photosynthesis and, and get it back to the sun. And so it's a nice way to talk about um, energy that we ha use every day that we don't even realize. And um, I like to say to kids, you're, you're solar powered people. Um, and just being out in the sun, we know it feels good, but also that solar energy gets into you in the form of food. So perfect, thank you very much. It's like, it's like we planned this. Nice work, David. <laughs> I have uh, another piece that I'm gonna ask you about. Um, I love that you have a greenhouse um, at your school. I think that's very, very cool. And I do like that you shared a little bit of the, the heating costs that, you, that are associated with that greenhouse as well. Um, beyond uh, using, uh, you said it was, it was coal fired for your, for your heat or is it natural gas fired for your heat? I think it would be natural gas. Yeah, I meant the electricity. Electricity sure. aligned energy is all coal, coal fired in Sheboygan. Okay. Perfect, because that's actually where I wanted you to go. Natural gas, still a non-renewable resource, um, but here in Wisconsin, 60% of our energy, our electrical energy usage comes from burning coal. 
Um, and you're right, we need the electrical energy to power probably the lights and some other equipment that you have in your greenhouse. Um, what I want you guys to do right now is just wherever you're sitting, look around you and notice how many things you have right where you are that use electrical energy. Um, and especially during COVID times, it's, it's become more and more apparent. I know like my husband has been working from home since March. Um, all of a sudden we're running the air conditioning all summer where I would normally have that off um, while, while I'm home with the kids. Or, you know, we're having to charge our uh, computers and our phones and our tablets so much more often because our kids were home for a while. And so just those, those changes in um, energy usage based on circumstances in the world are something worth noting. Um, I know my husband and I have talked a lot about, you know, it's, it's great that his business is able to allow him to work from home, but we're having to recoup a lot of those costs and then they don't have those costs at work. And so I think a lot of those equity kind of issues um, are going to come up going forward as, as people do stay home and work more. Um, so it, it's really interesting to think about just the changes that have been made, especially in 2020, and to see if those are going to continue to be um, different as we go forward, or if it's going to shift back into kind of our, our old patterns. Um, so anyways, you guys did a great job uh, taking a look at your ideal day and looking at where you have energy used in your life. Um, the one thing I'm going to ask you to maybe challenge yourself on is to think about how you get your energy and how you can maybe give back to the earth a little bit. And this is going to sound a little funny, I realize, um, but I, I'm in the middle of a book study uh, at work, um, the book is called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And she was a speaker at um, the Wisconsin Association for Environmental Education Conference this year. And her big idea is we take so much from the earth and the earth gifts us so many things. So if we think about the energy costs of our daily life, whether it's natural gas, coal, petroleum, uh, wherever we get that energy from, a lot of it does come from the earth. And can we think about how to take care of the earth so as to give back and make it a, a reciprocal relationship is how she would put it. And so I think as a piece of that, just being aware and just acknowledging that, yeah, I, I need these things to uh, go forward with my life, but how can I make sure that what I'm doing is, is honoring that and is kind of taking care of, of what I have. Um, and so I just think that's a, a neat concept and a good way to go forward and, and thinking about how we use our energy. All right, so that activity is called Ideal Day. Again, really easy to do with whomever in your life and whoever is around you. The next activity we're gonna do is an appliance hunt. It looks like just about everybody went back into the chat there and updated how many uh, appliances you had. And if I peek back there, I think, <coughs> excuse me, most of you said it was way more than you had, had anticipated. Um, and, and that's kind of the point of the activity is that we don't realize just how dependent we are on that electrical energy, usually until it goes away. Like we have a big storm or we have a power outage. That That's usually when we realize how dependent we are on it. Um, and I think for kids too, the other thing to point out is every single electrical appliance that you have in your home, you not only have paid for, but you pay to use it. And so it's a great activity to do is to just pull out your utility bill, whether you get it in the mail or whether it's something that comes digitally to you and just look at, you know, how much do we pay in electricity every month? And um, if you wanna graph that over a whole year, it's a great way to look at trends in your energy usage. Um, but just, you know, bring make that more apparent to kids. Like, yeah, you leave the lights on all day? Guess what, we do pay for that. Or, you know, if you wanna have your gaming system ready to go, it's always there waiting for you to turn it on, but it's sucking power that whole time. And so just making them more aware of all the different ways that we use electrical energy um, is, is pretty eye-opening in a lot of ways for kids. So anyways, what I'd like you guys to do now is go ahead and hold up that one appliance that you brought back. And if you forgot to bring one back, now's your chance, go get it. Okay, I think 
coffee maker there maybe got a blender if you don't want to turn on your video go ahead and uh throw it in the chat there david i don't know what that is tiny paper know? shredder tiny paper shredder all right <laughs> you have to even you have in to rip kitchen? your paper in half and then put it through in the kitchen too <laughs> Awesome. All right, I see some blenders. Very cool. All right, coffee grinders. All right, so without looking at the electrical information on there, I want you to guess the wattage of your electrical appliance. So when we're measuring electrical energy, we measure it in watts. And no peeking, no peeking at the information. Cheater, big cheater. <laughs> and if you are not sure, this is where I'm going to just do a quick screen share. If you're not sure, um what it looks like if you're cheating already it should look something like this but make a guess first and this works really well with kids because uh, they usually don't even know that such a thing exists on all their appliances and then when you're ready so once you've done your prediction go ahead and take a look at either the tag that is on the um the cord or somewhere on the bottom of your appliance should be the electrical information what we're looking for is wattage. So if you look at the picture that I have shared up here, I've got um, I've got my waffle maker down here too. And in all of uh, the kind of mumbo jumbo that's at the bottom there, we're looking for this electrical information. Um, I've got 120 volts. AC stands for alternating current. Operates at 60 hertz. That's the frequency. And then on here it says that my waffle maker will draw 1,200 watts of electricity. If I look at my um, mixer, the electrical information is right here and it gives me 0.6 amps, 120 volts, alternating current only, 60 hertz, but it doesn't give the wattage and yours might look like this as well. Easy way to figure it out. If you take your amps times volts, that gives you watts. So in this instance, I would take 0.6 amps times 120 volts. That gives me 72 watts. Okay, so I'll leave the screen up here for a little bit, but what I want you to do is figure out the wattage of the appliance that you brought back, and then go ahead and drop that in the chat. So just to talk about wattage a little bit, um, when we uh, look at electrical energy, wattage is the amount of energy it uses at one instantaneous moment in time. Um, because energy is measured over an amount of time. You're measured by your usage over time. So when we look at our electrical bill, uh, we'll see that we have kilowatt hours. So a kilowatt is a thousand watts, and then we multiply that by hours so we can tell how long we use that electrical energy for. So if I look at what you guys have on here, uh, Nikki's got the coffee cup thing. She's guessing a thousand. Nikki, did you find out exactly what it was? Feel um, free to I, 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 did, I did not. I could go back up to my kitchen and look at the full coffee maker. Oh, but gotcha, I did gotcha. Not. I only okay. brought the, the cup thing. Okay. I understand. I understand. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, interesting guess though, a thousand watts. Um, pretty different from Zachary who had the grinder, I assume, Zachary, and that was 130 watts. Why do you think there is, and, and, and I think, let's see, the air fryer was 1700 watts. Um, toaster is 750. Those are some big numbers. Why do you guys think that those particular items would have wattages that are so high compared to like my 72 watt mixer. Any thoughts on that? Don't be shy. I could see the size of the gear inside a mixer using basically larger gears to amplify the power. When you're talking about a coffee grinder, it needs to do the work really quickly and efficiently and fast. Um, and power through sometimes really tough, you know, food items. And sure. so maybe just that extra power gives it kind of a quick burst of speed and, and it needs to use a lot of electricity to keep up the work. Sure. So absolutely. So if, if we think about my mixer, it's, you know, it's, it's spinning fast enough that it would hurt my fingers if I stuck it in there. But if I compare that with like my food processor, that one has a lot more power and it spins a lot faster. So it would require a little bit more energy. Um, Kyle, I think you're the winner with the air fryer. You have 1700 watts. Um, why do you think it's got so much uh, draw when you plug it in and use it? Uh, 
Um, one, it's, I mean, like it's pumping air. Part of what makes like the air fryer do its thing is that it's like constantly circulating air and it has heat going. And then like, like if you use the tumbler, like then there's also like tumbling happening. So like Zach That's said, like lots of things happening. Yeah. Yeah, and if we, uh, we've got an activity at Keep where we have a list of a whole bunch of different appliances and we have people try and put them in order of uh, wattage. And what we find through the course of doing the activity is all of the appliances that either have to produce a lot of heat or have to do cooling are the ones that are going to use the most electricity. So if you were to take a look at your refrigerator, um, it's going to draw a lot of electricity, not to mention it's running 24 hours a day. And what you can do going forward is if you're ever interested in how much energy, uh, whatever, <laughs> totally trick question, whatever you have at home, uh, you can purchase one of these. This is a watt meter. There's lots and lots of different kinds of them um, available at Home Depot and things like that. Um, but a watt meter like this, you just plug into the wall and then you plug your appliance into it. Um, it'll turn on and then you can see how many watts of energy it's drawing and then depending on how long you leave it plugged in or how long you leave that appliance on, it'll tell you exactly how much energy that appliance drew. Now the reason this kind of comes in handy is there's a lot of variable wattage appliances. So if you think about like your washing machine, um, sometimes it's spinning and using a lot of electricity, sometimes it's just agitating and just using a little bit. So this gives you a better idea of uh, how much your drawing. Um, I will say my dad uh, got one of these for when he was trying to determine if he needed to replace the uh, chest freezer that we had in our basement. Um, and I think that chest freezer, I'm not kidding, was from like the 1950s. So he plugged that in, determined it was more expensive to run that chest freezer for a couple of months than it was to buy a whole new chest freezer. And so that's where it really comes in handy is to look at what appliances you have that are efficient and what ones are maybe it'd be more economical for you to replace. Um, so kind of kind of a neat um, a little appliance that you can use to help you make those decisions. Um, the last couple of things that I'll that I'll talk about before we open it up to questions um, are a couple of things that you can do just really easy changes in your everyday life um, to reduce your electrical energy uses especially. Um, a few years ago, my husband and I got solar panels put on the roof of our house and we took a real close look at our energy usage and tried to figure out um, what was going to work best for us. One thing that we realized we could do is we could go on a time of use plan uh, for our electricity. So we pay a different amount during the day than we do at night. So it's a 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. is a lot cheaper energy for us. So that's when we tend to run the dishwasher, run um, laundry and, and some of those bigger appliances. Um, but it, it, that saved us money um, just overall in a year. But I will say, even though we had the solar panels, the biggest thing that saved us money was going through our whole house and we replaced all of the bulbs with LED bulbs. So we switched over from incandescents in some places, and CFLs in some places, and just went to the straight LEDs. And when we looked at a comparison between before we had them and after, our energy bill had gone down 30%. And we attribute a lot of that to those LED bulbs. So that's a really easy one to do going forward. An easy way to get those, if you're in Wisconsin, is we have what's called the Focus on Energy program. And it's a free program um, sponsored by the utilities and by the state. And they actually have uh, kits that you can get for free because it's sponsored by your bills that you pay to the utilities already. And I think every three years you can get a kit that has uh, either a whole bunch of LED bulbs or it's got some low flow shower heads or insulators for your water heaters. And like I said, it's free. If you go to the Focus on Energy website, um, it's a great thing to share with your family and friends that, that's available to everybody who lives in Wisconsin and pays uh, utility uh, bills. So. I'll leave you with those kinds of two action things going forward. We've said a lot of times that uh, WCEE is, you know, it's not necessarily environmental education that we do. It's like life education um, yeah. because we always have to think about, you know, our energy. You know, we don't always have to think about it, but it's part of our lives. We need to know where our water is coming from and where it's going. We need to know where our energy is coming from and where it's going and how much we're paying for it. And, you know, we don't often think about the environmental cost of things, but 
it is a piece of all of our lives.